Mr. Alamba, there's concern from opponents that Public Law 90 will undermine the delivery of health care in rural Maine. Do you agree, disagree, and why? You know, we were on a panel recently, and, and Dr. Steele, who was, was quoted in, in Garrett's opening remarks, talked about this, he talks about this inverted pyramid. If you ever heard, Dr. Steele is the medical director for Eastern Maine Health Care System. And it's the fact that essentially these, you know, hip replacements and joint replacements and the MRIs and the CAT scans support the entire system. I can also tell you that if you look at cost and quality data, and by the way, cost and quality correlate in healthcare. Higher quality, lower cost go together nine times out of ten. In the inverted pyramid, if, if you were, let's say that you're that person and you need a hip replacement or a knee replacement, and you could go to Blue Hill Hospital and you could certainly have that done. <clears throat> but what I can tell you is that in Blue Hill they probably do, and I'm really winging the numbers here, but just to make the point, let's say they do a dozen hip replacements in a year. And let's say the cost of that hip replacement is $25,000 because, they, again, they've got to subsidize the other services within the hospital. Down in Boston, that same hip surgery and, let's say, Mass General, I'm going to guess they probably do 2,000 of them a year, and the cost is probably going to be closer to $6,000. There's going to be that much of a discrepancy. So I would first ask the question, if you're the patient, A, wouldn't it be nice to know what those cost differences are and the number that are done, and where would you choose to have it done? And the question that I asked Dr. Steele after our, our last uh, forum was, I, I get that the rural health care system is sort of resting on the head of the pin, and it's very unstable simply because of that. But I completely reject the idea that this law is what's going to tip it off of the, the pinhead. The problem is that it's resting on the head of the pin. What's going to be the trigger that makes it collapse? You tell me, but clearly it's not sustainable. And this is again separating, we have health care delivery challenges that are separate from health insurance regulations. We need to focus on the root causes. Clearly, we need to focus on rearranging and redesigning our delivery system so that we can afford it and it serves us all regardless of where we live in this state. But our insurance regulations are not how we're going to get there. So, I'm mindful that it is Halloween and you have to figure out whether this is a trick or a treat, but we'll see. Um, the, I just want to respond to one thing that, that Joel said, which is that uh, that cost is nine times out of ten <coughs> quality. Cleveland Clinic and the Mayo Clinic, two of our nation's finest medical facilities. Same procedure, $22,000 differential. It's not always the case. In Arista County, two hospitals within 19 miles of each other, hip replacement, $16,000 differential. Now, I do agree that all of us, including our providers, how many of you all have had the experience where you go into your doctor, they refer you to blood work, and they don't know what the cost of that blood work is? Much less that if you go to the Nordex facility, and I'm not an advertisement for Nordex, or some other facility, that you could receive that same blood work for $200 less. So I think it is true that, that many of us don't really know what the actual costs are. And, and I can say that as somebody who had a period of high consumption. So you, you learn to do that. Um, but with regard to the question about what's going to happen to rural Maine, I think the jury is out with regard to, to this particular law. And I say that because there is the provision that's going to allow insurance companies to change the way in which consumers access local care. And more than likely, that will bump out that base, the head of the pen, if you will. Um, but we just don't know because those rules are still being developed. And I think it is true that in the conversation about this bill, folks were very concerned about the implications of that. But again, I don't think folks are very honest in saying there's a problem here. Now, the other thing I want to highlight, though, with regard to the rural care and, and our future health care in general, and this is something that we haven't talked about yet, but is a big piece of this bill. This bill got rid of the Advisory Council for Health System Development. That is a body that includes providers, consumers, businesses, whole bunch of different stakeholders in our healthcare system. And what has their job been for the last few years? It's been to talk about these issues, talk about the fact that why is it 
our rural health care system is based on this head of the pin? Why is it that we're not delivering primary care in a cost-effective manner? Why is it that we're not dealing with inefficient use of emergency rooms? And that's where most people are showing up for their primary care. Why is it that we're having readmits all the time when we could avoid those things if we actually transition patients more effectively? That was the charge of this committee, this council. This bill did away with that group. And from a standpoint of what may happen for rural health care and health care in general in the state, it's those kinds of things where we where we've basically said, you know what, we're going to hit the reset button and we're just going to do it this one particular way and we're not that interested in other different viewpoints and opinions on how to go forward. But some of the most productive and effective work around addressing these issues was being done in that, that committee. And that's gone. Um, so unfortunately there was a proposal to resurrect that committee. Uh, in fact, it was sponsored by Representative Graham, who's here today, that, that I believe the Legislative Council has not let through. Uh, but hopefully we will continue to push the case for that particular body and mechanism. Um, before closing our remarks, we're going to open up for any questions or comments from the audience. So, I haven't had health care or health insurance really since I graduated when I was 22. And in Maine, individual plans are astronomically high. Uh, my mother is a single woman in her 50s. She can barely afford health care, and it's a very, you know, she pays a lot of money for not a lot of coverage. If this, like, I was really excited when I heard this bill, because one of the reasons why I think health insurance was so expensive in this state is because there is no competition. There's one game in town, and if you don't go to Blue Cross Blue Shield, that's basically it. So what, what do you think is the solution? If it's not regulating health insurance or <coughs> deregulating health insurance, or then, then, what, then how do we solve this problem while maintaining care in rural areas? Because I know that is a huge problem and Maine is a very rural state. And also, what do you do about young people? I can't afford health insurance. If I paid for health insurance, I wouldn't be able to feed myself. I wouldn't be able to have housing. Uh, it's it's an absurd situation that we find ourselves in, and that's where people go when they can't afford health insurance is the emergency room, which we all pay for. Since that's a huge question, I'll take a little sliver of it. Which is fine. I know it's a huge question, but <laughs> a huge problem. problem. It's really easy. You just, uh, no. Um, <laughs> you know, I, there's a couple key points. First of all, um, having rates that are less expensive for, for younger people there's, there's logic there. You're not purchasing coverage today, probably because you're looking at these premiums going four or five hundred dollars a month. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, you know, it's just not doesn't make sense. Now, if that rate for you was hundred and fifty dollars a month, as you could stomach it, we'd still be better off with you paying it because you're still less likely to use care in excess of that hundred and fifty dollars a month. Let's get that money into the pool. But. You know, I think there are there are a few key things that need to align for us to get our health care costs truly to go down over time. And the challenge is that none of these are simple, easy things, but I just want to share a couple. Um, I would suggest something to do is I didn't bring the slide with me today, but I've shown it in other settings like this. We've gone onto the CDC's website, the Center for Disease Control, and track they track a lot of different diseases throughout the United States. But one interesting one I would suggest taking a look at is the obesity trends in the United States over the course of the last couple decades. And you can correlate that to, to adult onset diabetes, to chronic illness, and so on and so forth. So I would first say that we cannot, as a society, just, uh, this is characterizing, and I know we're not all in this uh, category, but I'm going to throw it out there anyway to make my point. Sit on the, the couch, eat Fritos, drink uh, you know soda pop, and expect that we're all going to be healthy and have low health care costs over time. There is a correlation to our behaviors. There's a gentleman who does a lot of innovative work in the state on wellness programs that will tell you that 70% of health care costs could be avoided had we made different decisions along the way. So we have to have some sort of personal responsibility connected to our health care costs. It can't simply be free to all. One of the second things is that we really need to be connected to the cost of care. I mean, you've heard about some of the cost discrepancies just in this, in this debate, and it's absolutely true. I can tell you an MRI in the state, you could spend $600 to have an MRI done, you could spend 4000 I had somebody tell me one day, it's kind of like going through the supermarket and having no prices, you know, and figuring out what you spent when you get to the checkout. I actually think it's a lot more insulting than that. 
It's more like going through the supermarket having no prices, no checkout at all. Just go home with your groceries, eat them with your family, and then let's say a couple weeks after you've consumed all the groceries, then getting a bill saying, hey, by the way, here's what you spent. That's how our system works today, and that clearly has to stop. We need to know and have a connection to what the cost of services are. We certainly need to be incented to, 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 to be healthier to begin with. And we have to get out and off the hamster wheel of fee for service, which is how we pay our doctors and hospitals. If you think about it, the doctor that gives me the most value is probably the one that helps me not see them very often. But we don't pay a doctor for that in our current system. In fact, our primary care physicians, they, are, they get the shortest stick when it comes to our healthcare system. We completely don't pay them, and they literally are the most important component of our system. So we have to know what stuff costs, I disagree with the statement that, that, that uh, markets can't work in healthcare. Of course they can. We haven't tested it yet. When's the last time you knew what your services cost and knew what the differences were from one physician to the next? But the things I'm talking about aren't fixed overnight. And there's something that literally takes a change in mindset for all of us individually. I don't think this is going to be a situation where someone comes down and hands us a simple solution. I think if it was that easy, it would have happened a long, long time ago. I think it's going to involve every one of us being part of that solution. So I just, I think your question is the one that everybody's struggling with. And um, regrettably, there's not a quick solution. Right. I mean, the quickest solution for you, quite frankly, would be if your mom could put you on her health insurance plan, right? Yeah. I mean, that's what the Affordable Care Act allowed for. But I, I do, I would, I would, and, and I also want to make the distinction between knowing how much things cost and having a market are two very different things. Um, and, and I do, we'll debate that another day, but uh, what we do agree on is that our fee-for-service model is completely out of whack. Uh, there's no question about that, and we just have to get over it. Um, the two things I would say as a state where we could be directing more attention and it could lead to measurable benefits for you is one is just getting a handle on those high cost patients and really supporting up front the efforts to manage the cost of their care more productively and effectively. Um, we know where those people are. We know how to do things to, to improve their outcomes. And in fact, there is a, there's a rural hospital in the state that hired a social worker and a nurse to work with some high cost patients on transitioning them from their providers and being sort of a, a navigator through the health system. In four months, they saw a reduction in costs associated with that patient cohort of three million dollars. Now, what does that mean for that provider? It actually means they're going to have to lay off some nurses if they're really effective, right? Or even some docs. And so that's one of the sticky widgets in this is Everybody's got to come to the table and sacrifice. The other thing I would say is that we have to prioritize prevention and wellness. Now, the fundamental issue we face in our healthcare system, and it's, whether it's the lack of transparency, whether it's the structure of the system, is the incentives are not aligned between insurance companies, healthcare providers, and patients. And until we figure out how to better align those incentives, you know, I think of, I, quite frankly, this is an unpopular statement, but I think of insurance companies as toll collectors. You know, and they, they, they take their toll as I come through. They obstruct my view from where I want to be at the end of the day. And they slow down the, the process in some ways. So I just, I think there are some sticky questions, but there are a couple of solutions that, that are in the near term. Any other questions? I think uh, you both agree about what the problems are. I think the problem with, with this law is it did nothing to address any of them. All it did <coughs> was to contra the whole of my insurance. The insurance is that the expensive people are covered by the mass. Every insurance population has the 90% and 10% split. And all we did here was to create a situation where the less expensive people could opt out of participating in any of the others. And that is contrary to the whole idea of insurance. And it may have benefited a few people, but ultimately it doesn't help the system in any way. Well, you, you know, the Affordable Care Act tries to, if you picture it on a scale, they're trying to cover more people. This is the federal law. And then, of course, you've got to pay for it. And they went to guarantee issue community rating basically nationwide. 
And the lawmakers recognize that, okay, we can't just tell every insurance company, you've got to take everyone, you can't ask them health questions, you can't exclude pre-existing conditions if they don't have to buy insurance because, well, I'll just wait till I get sick and then I'll go buy insurance and then I'll cancel it. That literally happens in Maine's market today. I can give you tons of stories of that where someone comes in, buys a policy, gets their service, and then they dump it. So they needed to strike the balance and have the mandate which says everyone's got to be in the pool, we all got to purchase. But remember, today we don't have that. We have one half of that scale in the state of Maine, which basically means the insurance company has to take everyone. There are limits to what they can do in terms of pre-existing conditions, but you and I don't have to buy. You know, you're a great example. You're not today. And, and probably for obvious reasons. Your likelihood of needing the policy and needing care are slim right now, your current age and, and health status. So somehow that market has to attract the right balance in. That means it has to strike a chord for somebody and be a good economic decision. And so I agree that this law doesn't solve the broader problems, but I disagree that it isn't a huge step in the right direction to stabilize our insurance markets. Remember, we've been in this death spiral for a while. Eventually, it does hit the ground. I mean, we can keep our insurance laws exactly the way they were currently structured, and we'll, you know, we're down to basically one carrier in the individual market. We've got three holding on to the small group. Let's get down to one in the small group, too, and see how things go for us. So I, I just want to respond. I, you know, whether it's a death spiral in Maine's market or a death spiral nationally, it's a death spiral everywhere. And there's death panels, death spirals. We can use all the death terms we want. But I think whether you're in Maine or in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, everybody's got the same issue, which is that our health care costs are completely out of whack. I would completely agree with you that this bill, this particular bill, because of the way the reinsurance program is currently structured, it, it does hold harmless insurance companies. It subsidizes them. It gives them a direct subsidy against their cost of covering those high cost patients. So it actually removes their incentive to do the things that they should be doing to manage that risk more effectively. And that's something we should be talking about because it's a huge giveaway to them. Um, and in, 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 in truth, I think at the end of the day, it really, it hurts us because if they're gonna sort of have that free pass, how are we gonna ever control those costs? Um, it seems to me that the problem comes down to with laws like this, uh, what they really are trying to do is balance providing more coverage uh, for the individual in society while guaranteeing profits for the health insurance companies. And the problem is, ultimately, is that's the discussion that everybody's avoiding. That's the elephant in the room. I mean, the elephant and these laws, I mean, they don't do anything to address the actual issue. And the actual issue is whether or not we can cover more of the population while sustaining the profits of the insurance company. And it's possible that in fact we cannot. I would just, a little bit of a loaded question, but I'll just, uh, I'll say this, I was on the radio this morning and I'll set it there, probably get a few emails for this one, I'll say it again. Um, I really don't think profits are a bad thing here. And you need to recognize that in the health insurance market, for example, anyone have an idea what average profits are in the health insurance market nationally? 2%. 2%? You're about there. 2 to 4% is about the number. The Affordable Care Act, one of the things the Affordable Care Act does is they put taxes, uh, new fees on insurance companies. And the, the intent of that was, well, they're making all these exorbitant profits. Let's pull those back and give them back to the consumers. Did you know that when those come into effect under the Affordable Care Act, that the amount of money that it takes out of the private insurance market is greater than the combined profits of every for-profit health insurance com uh, company in this country? So when you add that new tax on, do you really think it's not going to get passed on to your premiums? I also have, when I go shop for a small company in this state, I've got three different major insurance carriers I can go to. Two are for-profit and one is non-for-profit. So if the profit argument is truly the issue, then, then that non-for-profit insurance carrier should be delivering me lower rates every time. And it just flat out is not the case by a long shot. So remember, profits serve a purpose in the market as well. 
because if I'm all trying to make a profit and I'm battling against each other, that's also where innovation comes from. So there is a balance to be struck, and I would just use caution about determining that because something is for profit, that makes it evil. Because I just don't think that correlation, correlation exists. So I, I just, I think one issue here is when we look at the cost structure of our system, there are huge inefficiencies in how it's currently rendered. So whether it's 2%, 4%, I don't care. Because if you think about the nurse on the floor who's in a fee-for-service model, how much time they have to dedicate to filling out the right paperwork or scanning the right numbers, and the 35% administrative costs. I mean, think of the back offices that support small healthcare facilities, and how much of that is all about just processing paper for payments. So that's where I see the flaw. I think. I think the real question that we have to struggle with, and it's not only about healthcare, it's about so many other issues that we face as a state and as a country, is on one hand we have folks who say, I want my cake and eat it too, screw the rest of you, right? And on the other hand, you know, to play the other extreme, it's put it all together and we all sort of divvy it up evenly. Somewhere there's a balance in between those two perspectives, and we seem incapable of putting those different alternatives on the table and really figuring out what's going to make the most sense and achieve the best outcomes that we want. I think lost in this conversation, it was all about cost, right? It's all about somebody else somewhere else to get a better deal. We weren't talking about is it actually going to result in better health outcomes? Is it actually going to result in more people having access to health care? None of that was part of the discussion. And that's the part that drives me to distraction. Because I think the whole sort of opening it up to com competition from out of states, that's a red herring. It wins a lot of political points, but from a substantive standpoint, it does very little to achieve the outcomes that we can agree we want. So that's my Closing remarks? Sure. Um, I'll just close by saying, you know, again, health care, health insurance, two very different things. Um, this law takes a number of important steps to firm up Maine's insurance market, and it does matter. It matters in, in many ways. Um, but I'll also concede that the major issues driving our health care costs are still before us. We've got a lot of work yet to be done. Um, and I think where we have the opportunity to, to succeed, you know, if you take the two opinions that are sitting here in front of you, you know, if you draw a circle around me and draw a circle around Garrett, well, there's a whole great big section where we have common ground. And I think that's where our real opportunity is to solve these problems over the long term. And as long as we keep the politics and the partisanship aside, then uh, that's where we need to be focused here over the next several years. And just remember that that boils down to the actual cost of care and getting at the root of what's driving up those numbers. Because that's the problem. We're trying to wrap our insurance coverages around an extremely inefficient and, and overly expensive system that quite frankly oftentimes is not even delivering care that we as patients are satisfied with. It's that cost that we truly need to get our arms around. So with regard to this particular law, I personally think it's time for the legislature to do have a gut check. I think that increasingly the results are coming in. There are folks who are seeing their rates go up. Now, what I think there is a portion to which they're attributed to other factors. I think there's a portion to which they're attributed to this law. And I think the legislature actually has a chance to revisit this proposal and improve it. The question is, will they? And what's troubling about this is at the end of the day, what was ignored throughout this process was a desire to really make decisions based on the best possible available information. The Bureau of Insurance, the entity that is tasked with overseeing our insurance markets in the state, the entity that has the best possible information on how these different assumptions may play out, was kept out of the process. If that's the way we're going to go about legislating in the state, we're all in for equal trouble. Because what it ultimately becomes is an ideological fistfight. And that doesn't serve anybody's interests. What we need to get back to is the kind of mechanisms like the Advisory Council on Health Systems Development and other bodies 
who are charged with looking at the best available information and using that information to serve the best interest of Maine people. I would argue that this particular law never did that. There are things it can deliver, and it's not beyond repair. But to get there, it's anybody's guess. My hope is that the legislature will take that up and revisit these issues, but we'll see. So thank you.